Welcome back, folks, to another week of the Andy Social Podcast. My name is Andy Dowling, and straight into it, this week's shout out. If you are new to the podcast, each and every week I thank somebody that supports me, supports the Andy Social Podcast, Self Starter, Lord, whatever it might be. And it can be in a range of different ways. It could be something as simple as a message of support or a, a suggestion for an upcoming guest of the podcast. It could be buying some merch via the Andy Social uh, online store or the Lord one. It could be shouting me a beer via the PayPal button over on my andysocial.net page. It could be leaving a review somewhere on the internet. Whatever it might be, it all helps. It all helps me um, keep me motivated, keep me fueled up, and um, it ensures that I continue to keep all these things moving. So uh, thank you to everyone that continues to support me in a whole range of different ways. But each week there can only be one, and I'm putting them on public records. So here we are. This week's shout out is for, and this is an old guest, Terra Rome. Now, Terra was on the uh, episode 128 of the podcast and Tara was the first woman to walk around Australia solo and unassisted massive feat um, you can go back and listen to that episode absolutely an amazing woman and an amazing achievement and she's uh, got plenty of other massive plans coming in the future as well but uh, the reason for Tara's shout out this week is that Tara went and bought a patch and she's uh, attaching it to her travel gear so I'm expecting a photo in the upcoming weeks and months so Tara please send me something through but thank you so much for buying a patch that's so awesome you didn't even need to do that you probably could have just asked me but nonetheless you <laughs> went and bought one and you supported me so I I really, really appreciate it. And please, I'm going to send you out something as well. So when you listen to this, uh, click me a message and I'll uh, shoot something out in the post. I'll send you a message anyway. But thank you so much, Tara. And thank you so much to everybody that continues to support me in all these different uh, ways. And whether it be Andy Social, Self Starter or Lord, it all helps. It all um, adds up to this amazing uh, bit of work that I'm doing. And uh, just blah, 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 blah. You guys know the drill. So thank you so much. I play bass in the Australian metal band Lord, and if you love a bit of heavy metal, you can go to lord.net.au and check out our brand new website designed by Tim, and in my biased opinion, it's one of the best band websites on the internets. So if you're curious and you want to measure your band website up against ours, I dare you, go to lord.net.au and check it out. I'm actually quite impressed by it. I think it's actually a really, really good website, so props to Tim for his hard efforts there in creating... Uh, yeah, you know, an amazing resource for us and for uh, anybody that's curious about our music. But we've got uh, videos, video content, our back catalogue, streaming music, everything there. So if you have not checked us out yet, go over to lord.net.au and go and have a sticky beak. In addition to playing in a heavy metal band, I also host the Self Starter Podcast, which is all about small business, self-employment, and freelancing. So if that's something that floats your boat, go over to selfstarter.com.au and you can, uh, or you can search for Self Starter in your preferred podcast player, whatever you're listening to this through right now. So go and check that out and appreciate the support for that as well. All right, folks. Now I've got a bit of a metal plug. I'm doing this for a few weeks here. For anybody in Australia that's going to the upcoming Dragonland Australian tour uh, that's happening in early September. I think it's the first week of September. I'll, I've got some dates here I'll get to in a moment. Um, anyone that's bought tickets or is planning to buy tickets, I have 25 exclusive laminates uh, that are associated with this tour. They are Dragonland branded, but also Andy Social branded. Um, so it's nothing special. It's nothing incredible. It's nothing highly valuable. It doesn't give you any extra access, but nobody else has them. There's only 25 of them. And I'm, I've got them up for grabs for anybody, the first 25 people that have bought tickets or are planning to buy tickets, um, to grab them straight from Stu McGill over at Stormrider Touring. So what you need to do if you are keen, and once they're gone, they're gone. There's no more getting printed up and you can get them signed by the band as well. The band's going to be around. So great opportunity to get something really, really exclusive, um, and limited signed by the guys in, in the band as well. Um, but if you're keen, you, if you're interested, you want to jump on this and um, grab one, all you need to do is you need to buy a ticket first and foremost, of course. So you can go over to stormridertouring.com.au slash tickets, and you can buy a ticket for uh, whichever city, um, where are they? Canberra, Sydney, Brisbane, and Melbourne. I'll get to the dates in a sec. And once you've done that, shoot an email through to Stu from Stormrider Touring, and his email is stormriderfestival at live.com.au and just give him some proof of purchase of so you purchased the ticket and what show you're going to. And if there's any left, he will allocate one for you. I'm not sure he's going to do it yet. He might send it out in advance or it'll be available on the door on the night of the show. So either way, um, if you get in quick enough, you'll be able to get one of these exclusive laminates. And I was going to post it online, but I'm actually going to hold out and wait until the tour starts and these 
these passes are no longer available and they're gone. So I want to show everyone, you know, what it is, but also I want to make this exclusive to you guys that invest the time to listen to this podcast. It's just, it's one thing of, um, of many things in the future that I want to give back to you all and give you little exclusive, cool little things. Some may have monetary value. Some might just be just little cool things, whatever it might be. I just want to give back to you guys as much as I can. So a cool little thing there, only 25 available. As I said before, storm, stormridertouring.com.au slash tickets. Email Stu, stormriderfestival at live.com.au. And the dates, finally getting there. We start on the 4th of September, which is actually a meet and greet at Utopia Records in Sydney. That's Tuesday afternoon, the 4th, um, which I might actually go out and have a beer with the guys. We'll see how I go. Um, and then the first show kicks off on the 5th of September, Wednesday the 5th at the basement in Canberra. Then the following night, the 6th at the Bullface Stag in Sydney. Friday the 7th at Crowbar in Brisbane. And then Saturday the 8th at the Croxton Band Room in Melbourne, which is a pretty massive lineup. I think like Black Majesty, I Fear, Espionage, and I'm probably going to miss a couple of bands. Sorry, guys. But it's a really big lineup for the Melbourne one. So if you're in Melbourne and you haven't got a ticket yet, I'd probably like, I'd probably get onto that pretty quickly. So all the dates are there. You can go to stormridertouring.com.au slash tickets, and all the information will be there as well. But uh, thanks to Stu. Thanks to uh, Stu from Stormrider Touring. And um, hope you guys jump on board and grab one of those cool little laminates as well. Really appreciate it. This week's episode is with Steve Balby. This is so cool. I have wanted Steve on the podcast for quite a while and I have a bit of a, I don't know, I just got a little bit of a man crush on, on Steve. I've, I've been a massive Noiseworks fan. So for anybody know, that doesn't know, um, Steve was a bass player in Noiseworks and Noiseworks were one of our biggest um, Australian rock bands in the eighties into the early nineties. They've had so many massive hits. Um, if you aren't familiar with Noiseworks, I reckon you'll probably hear one of their songs and then go, ah, oh, actually I, I do know the band. Um, and he is an incredible songwriter. He has lended um, his talents to pretty much every hit um, that Noiseworks has put out there. Um, don't hold me to that statement, but I'm pretty sure he has. Um, and he's just an incredible musician. Um, and he's done so much over the years. He's worked with a whole range of different bands. Um, he went on after Noiseworks to do uh, Electric Hippies. He um, is currently fronting My Sex as well, which is another classic Australian rock band. Um, he's done a whole bunch of different projects over the years. He's got his solo work. Um, he did some stuff with David Bowie at one point. Um, He's worked with some incredible musicians. He's even doing um, an upcoming tour across Australia uh, with um, a 30-piece orchestra doing ACDC covers with Simon Wright of ACDC, Dio, um, Joel McDonald, who was previously on the podcast as well, and a whole bunch of other guys as well. It's just a really, really – like Steve just is constantly doing things, and I'm going to have all of this stuff in the show notes over at andysocial.net. So um, if I miss something, it'll all be over there, so make sure you go and check it out. Steve has a brand-new album that's coming out early next year, called humans and we jump into that a little bit into this chat about how that all came to be the inspiration and there's a really cool backstory to that um he's got a couple of singles that are coming out really soon as well so stay tuned um you can go to stevebalby.com he's doing a bunch of shows around uh i think some in sydney and melbourne um, all the dates are over there and I'm going to have a bunch of stuff in the show notes over at andysocial.net as well. But, um, I caught up with Steve in his studio in Ultimo, which is right in smack bang in the middle of Sydney. And we just sat down and just had this really cool chat. We talked about songwriting. We talked about, um, songwriting credits. Uh, we talked about a bit of noise works, uh, you know, era stuff. We talked about electric hippies. We talked about his solo stuff. We talked about also some really cool technology called atmosphere. Um, where he was able to collaborate with a lady by the name of Jessica Irwin, who has cerebral palsy. And through this amazing technology, which I'll let Steve explain, um, they were able to collaborate and create music together. It's just the most incredible thing. I'm going to put a video to that because there's an on state, uh, there's, there's a video clip for that, um, which I'll put in the show notes over at andysocial.net as well. But Steve just has his finger in so many different things and he's just, he's a real inspiration and somebody that's just constantly on the move. And he's one of the most talented musicians that I've ever met. And um, just so stoked that um, he was able to give me some time to be on the podcast and a massive thanks to Jeremy as well for hooking that up as um just it means a hell of a lot so um cheers guys and jeremy you'll have to be on the podcast sometime soon as well i think you've got a bit of an inter interesting story to tell that's steve's manager so enough of me stevebalby.com andysocial.net you guys know the drill please enjoy this absolutely awesome episode with steve balby 
<laughs> you know, and I don't force the point. I've yeah. never. I, I went through a, a, a phase many years ago where I, I'm a songwriter. I'm, I'm going to write a song a day, sort of Nashville style. Yeah. <laughs> you know, professional songwriter. It's like I, I don't think I've ever written so much rubbish in my whole life. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Churn and burn. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting thing because I think I've definitely gone through that frustration when you know the band's together and they're thinking oh we've got an album that we need to do and it's going to happen later in the year so everyone get your ideas together and we'll start sort of working them out and i'm, and I'm sitting there going hmm, okay i don't have any so now it's time to be creative now it's time to start creating something some contribution and you just and you force it yeah. and you force it and then you realize that uh 99 of the stuff that you're forcing out is absolute rubbish yeah, look, and I think it can be, uh, people have different skills, you know, some people, uh, you know, have the ability to just um, create great lyrics like that, you know, they may have a, a command of, of uh, you know, the English language and a, a writing uh, expertise that they can do that. I'm not one of those people. For me, I think it to answer your question when it comes is when probably when there's um something underlying in my in my life or in my my being that that um i may not be totally aware of and conscious of mm. but it it is there and it just sort of uh, wants to express itself because i write a lot of my lyrics on the fly it's sort of like i might have an idea and i start recording straight away you know on a phone or i've always had yep. a dictaphone and i pretty much write most of my lyrics as the idea comes perfect yep you know and i just sort of like make it you know tidy it up pretty much has that always been like that like always the dynamic change it's like it's not always like that no sometimes sometimes i need to you know i might have an idea and make the chorus may be there the, or the spine of the the song may be there and i need to work out what it is that it means to me and 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 how i want to express that and then choose my words yeah to connect with people absolutely yeah it is all about connecting and if i'm connected to the 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 theme and the spine of the 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 song uh i feel generally other people will connect did you find that that dynamic or i don't know if that, it's the right word but pressure you know from years back playing in a in a band mm. in a setting with a group of people that well not necessarily all equally contributing from a songwriting point of view but there's a different type of pressure where you're all commonly you've all got a common goal that you're trying to uh, say even me using that scenario before saying oh well we've got an album that needs to be done by a certain time mm. the type of pressure around that for people to contribute versus probably what you've done in later years as a solo artist mm. and being at the mercy of your own devices and your own time frame and your own standards has there been a different type of dynamic involved with with that um yeah look i, I think the only difference for me uh you know a collaborative effort um say a, from a band and the solo effort is that um it's a lot more direct and and i can say whatever i want to say you know, co-writing a lyric with someone, I find, I, I generally doesn't work for me. Mm. It's a convoluted sort of, it gets watered down. And, you know, one of the bands I was in, I found uh, it was very rare for us to be able to collaborative, collaboratively write a lyric. It just, um, you know, we all have such different angle on any event you know if you see an, you know three people see a car accident and they'll have three different stories and that's that's uh, i find that really difficult for songwriting i think the best songs generally come out of one person's heart and mind so well one thing that i noticed so i was going back through and having a look and to touch on just a little bit of noise works just mm. from a songwriting point of view when i was looking through credits and i was actually quite chuffed because i thought You've actually, or well, your credits are against one of my favourite songs from self, uh, self-titled self Only Loving You. Yeah. And I, I could see the, the dynamic of how the, the contributions were on that album versus the following two albums, which seemed to be very equal playing across a number of guys in the band. Mm. Um, 
was it was it a case with on that first album where you all had a song, a story, you brought it together and then created uh, a a container of music that you as an album, and then the follow up albums were where we've all got to try and create a story together, and that has uh, I guess different pros and cons attached to it. Mm. Yeah, well, look, I, I think. Um... I, th I think that sort of came about um, John Stewart and Kevin had a band called The Change so they pretty much had the, the lion's share of noise works in the sense of there were three of them and then there was Justin and I mm. Justin Stanley and myself we were, we were forming a band at that stage and um, I recorded a bass track for John Stewart and Kevin called a band called The Change I, I played bass for them on a the track and then they they asked me to join the band for like nearly a year. They'd come around to my house asking me to join and I just wasn't interested. I wanted to do this thing with Justin. And eventually, uh, Stuart and the boys came around and they, you know, instead of asking me to join the band, Stuart said, look, hey, um, we're not going to ask you to join the band. Can we join your band? <laughs> and and uh, we laughed and we thought, I said, look, let's just have a play. We'll see what happens. So, but if I'm coming, if I'm going to have a play with you guys, Justin's got to come as well. So we had a jam and we played White Room and it felt really good. And then we, we sat around and thought, well, let's just write some songs. John had already written, co-written a few, a few tracks. Uh, you know, I had Only Loving You and a few other bits and pieces. So we just kind of pulled it together. We got a record deal. Um, no Lies was a song that John had written with, um, oh, I can't remember his name now, anyway, uh, and it was a hit and off, off we went. So it was sort of, and then as, as sort of time went on, you know, I'm an authentic songwriter, I am a songwriter and, and that's where, you know, I sort of, I guess, you know, the, it just came to be that I had a lot more offerings. So. I think it was quickly worked out that we better even split everything. <laughs> yep, I understand that dynamic. You know, yeah, we better even split everything. I, you know, it's certainly it, we can't let you guys get more than us. Yeah, yeah. So it was it's sort of one of those things. Noiseworks is one of those really weird bands where everyone was equal, but some were more equal than others, and you know, it became a bit corporate and a little bit. You know, look, I, I appreciate those those times. It, it sort of gave me a platform to build a career on, and. Um, and it certainly showed me the things that I I wouldn't want to do again. You yep. know, the the classic story about uh, Noiseworks. Uh, a lot of people don't actually know it, and you know, Justin and I are always producers uh, at heart. You know, producers to be. Um, we paid I think it was Chris Kimsey a lot of money to he'd produce Rolling Stones, etc. Uh, etc. Et and um, we paid him a lot of money to produce our second record. And Justin and I thought, wow. You know, he's just pretty much re-recorded our demos and we thought <laughs> we put it to Sony on our third record that we produced the record and Sony agreed because they were going to save a lot of cash mm. but at the end of the day it was going to be Sony's choice whether the record was ready to be released or not. Right. So we produced this record and it was fabulous and they loved it and they said however you're two songs short of a hit record and they said, we want to send John and Stuart to America to write with hit writers. Huh. And I remember saying in that meeting, I said, yeah, okay, it's a kiss of death. And um, lo and behold, they, they sent John and Stuart to America. Stuart called me up saying, man, you've got to go. You're, you're a songwriter. I, you know, I write songs with people, but you're the guy. You've got to go. And I said, no, no, no. You can't pay me to go. <laughs> so I was really quite a stubborn little fella. And so Justin and I stayed here. Um, we built this little, we had this little um, terrace house the band owned in East Sydney. And we built this little, it was only probably enough to, to, to kneel in. It was a, it was a kind of a, a wooden cabinet with lead carpet over it where we'd do vocals so we wouldn't oh, right. okay. yeah. upset the neighbours. <laughs> and we had this little porter studio. And, you know, we're trying to write the, the songs there. And, um, you know, the, the label was spending a lot of money, uh, you know, in America, you know, studios and 
and we just got a bit annoyed with it. And I, I sort of went up to see our manager and um, I said, look, if we can write the song that you want, will you give us a week in a proper studio? Because this is a bit unfair. And he said, yeah, okay. And I said, well, what do you want? And he said, fast cars, rock and roll, chicks. <laughs> incredibly tacky <laughs> but the worst is yet to come because I went downstairs and I picked up a guitar and, I, and within about 15 minutes wrote Hot Chili Woman as a joke right? no, well as a joke it was as an offering to get a studio time so we could write some real material cheek. unfortunately at that moment the song was the cat was out of the bag so we did go into the studio and that's where it was a kiss to death because Justin and I started writing material that was soon to become the electric hippies sound we yep. didn't know that at the time but anyway it came time to show and tell and um the boys came back with about 14 songs from overseas and the songs that actually did save the record and got it to number one were our two songs we'd written a bunch here but there yep. were two songs from our batch which was a, a really sweet victory against that corporate label mm. splitting the band up and going you know we wrote this on an acoustic guitar in a little box in East Sydney, <laughs> and it didn't cost anything. Wow. Right? So, uh, you know, it was a very interesting time, and that, it was the kiss of death because Justin and I really enjoyed making that music that week, and it was always where we wanted to be. Mm. So I think I was really, I'm really proud of that move, and I hope my kids do the same thing, you know. It's like we're in a big business, you know. Noiseworks was a big business, and... Um, and Justin and I weren't happy creatively in that. Mm. And so we left. There's, I mean, that story or elements of that story are uh, repeated countless amount of times throughout music history, as mm. far as the last several decades of, of music. And me being in a band and understanding or trying to find common ground as far as where we all want to go. What's the goal? Where, what, what sort of sound are we? What, you know, where, where do we find that, um, that balance? Because you, and I always joke about this, you know, being in a band settings, like having, you know, multiple girlfriends and trying to keep everybody happy. Mm. Um, there's a real deep connection and relationship that you've got to try and maintain on top of everything else. Mm. So you have people with different personalities, different agendas, different things that inspire them, motivate them. And it's very natural to not see eye to eye all the time. And I haven't had the experience, but just from what you mentioned, having an element of that, and then on top of it, having all this corporate element to it, where you've got a, a large label that, you know, this is a big money-making business. And I would assume that when it came time to have those conversations about finding those extra songs. This is about the label wanting to ensure that they're getting their, what they believe is the proper return on investment. Mm. So it's, it's a product and yes, music is a business and it should be. And I think that, um, I think more musicians need to take, um, the approach of their band and their, their creativity in a, in a, a bit of a business sense as well, because otherwise I think you just get, you get taken advantage of, but, um, it would have been absolutely, it would have been so difficult to, to maintain personalities on a day-to-day -day basis normally, but also to have that overarching uh, pressure as well. Absolutely. It's amazing how, you know, you, when bands stay together for a long time, yep. you know, uh, Rolling Stones, I mean, you know, I mean, it's probably fairly easy for them to stay together in one sense, because I don't think they, they actually know anything else. Um, but you know, people are people and I guess it's, it's all about what you do it for. You know, I, I didn't want to leave the money and the comfort, hmm. but that didn't matter to me or Justin at the time. What mattered to us was, you know, um, the creativity and the art of it. Um, and that mattered more than money. You know, and to be honest, you know, we didn't make anywhere near as much money for a long time, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was really happy and, and felt really validated. You know, um, the Electric Hippies record did really well in, in Europe. And if it wasn't for, you know, I guess uh, my personal life, um, you know, that my personal war, I guess, I think the Electric Hippies were poised to be actually quite 
quite successful in Europe, um, uh, which is, you know, uh, an, a whole other story in itself. Yeah, definitely. I think I, I'm making an assumption, but I would, I would assume that forming the Electric Hippies and, and doing that and going through that process of compiling music, that creative process, and then sharing that with the public um, would have been so refreshing from mm. where you'd come from. 100%. I mean, the, it, it, in so many ways. I mean, when the hippies started making our record, Nirvana just hit mm. big time. It was massive. It was big. It was boisterous. And it was a big attitude. And we, and you know, we went the total opposite. <laughs> we, we just went, no, no way. You know, we're not jumping on any wagons. We're going to do this thing. And we, we had this idea, you know, we, um, we had this crappy bits and pieces drum kit, some tea towels. We had one guitar, a uh, Fender Jag. We had this little amp that had a torn speaker and a few knobs on it and and a ghetto blaster and the rule was that's that was our only guitar source <laughs> and we had one bass and a casio keyboard <laughs> and we were gonna and we had all these little rules we made ourselves these creative boundaries which i think was such a great idea because um you know, I'd lay down an acoustic vocal, Justin would play drums, I'd play a bit of bass with him, and then one of us would decide to play guitar. And the, the trick was, we weren't allowed to use tuners, we had to just tune by ear, so it gave it a little bit of yep. mm, fudge. Yep. Um, and if you were going to do a guitar sound, you'd have to put, you know, dial the knobs in on your guitar and then choose your either ghetto blaster or the amp, <laughs> you'd, you know, you'd maybe put an effect in whatever sound you came up with that's it you had to record that and honestly when you when you when you solo 24 tracks of each of those sounds individually <laughs> the tw most the 24 of the worst sounds you've ever heard in your life <laughs> put together and it was this wonderful sort of quirky sound and then we decided to top it off. We'd wear some mirror ball suits and, and sort of <laughs> it's just so not Nirvana. it's eclectic mix yeah i mean um I shouldn't tell you this. We were the, we were, I actually think we were one of the first real independent bands in Australia. We were, you know, we did it on a shoestring. We even, we had these elaborate, elaborate sort of um, plans because we were making the record on tape and tape was expensive and mm. we didn't have any money. So we knew that in the vaults of Sony, <laughs> there were all these, because back in the day, you know, you, to record one song, you'd use four or five reels of tape. And we knew that Noiseworks had all these outtakes, all these <laughs> reels and reels. So we did this plan where I'd park the car near the garage of Sony uh, archives. Justin would go and talk to, the, to Ross about a, a piece of equipment and he'd just go blabbing out. And I'd nip into the garage and pick all the outtake reels and put them in my boot <laughs> and we'd go and record. <laughs> I hope they don't come to pick me up after that, but, uh, after telling this story. But it was it was fantastic, you know. It was um, that was fun. It's all about being resourceful. Uh, you know, uh, you just got to do what you got to do. Anything for the sound, we used to say. Was that? I mean, it, no doubt. As I said before, like refreshing to be away from what you'd left behind and being in a different dynamic and being able to, I guess, have a bit more creative license to be able to just put things together and work with somebody that you've worked really well with over the years. But were there, were there challenges with adjusting, adjusting from what might possibly have been, um, things taken care of, um, in the past, whereas now, as you said, like, you know, being one of the first independent bands, that basically means it's, it's DIY, you know, and you're, you're yeah. doing a lot of it yourself. Was, was that a bit of a, an adjustment that you had, you both had to go through? Well, I haven't really thought about that, but, um, yeah, it was, you know, uh, it, it was more of a sense of freedom mm. more than anything else. Uh, I, I don't think, I'm sure there was an adjustment, but it was really welcomed and it was really enjoyed. It, we really loved you know, just being us uh, and being very natural. I mean, you know, to be honest, I don't think we ever really were meant to be in that band. I don't think we were ever really were meant to be in Noiseworks. Mm. We kind of, if it wasn't for that 
that first single having instant success we you know we're both pretty loyal people so it went off and we just and it, there was an element of fun I mean yeah. you know hey look we were we were 20 years old 21 years old and our, we had a hit record you know so that was it was pretty easy to be excited about that and we sort of but but in our heart of hearts um it slowly diminished our our feeling of self and and um you know creativity of where we really wanted to be and it it take these things take their toll now with you know doing your solo work and you've done you know you put out releases in the past and you've got another one coming out next year that whole and you can correct me if i'm wrong but i guess from what i could see over more recent years you've had projects mm. things that you can come in create something and then step out of it mm. and you continue to do that and obviously there's a lot of pros that come along with that you know creative um, experience and working with different types of people and different types of music and that's obviously a lot of a lot of development and opportunity there um, do you find that working on projects and even your solo album being a project um, has a more benefits than just being in a band collective where it's there's a career based on the band itself yeah i am um... I have a, my mind's really open and it's, um, I, I hate repeating myself. I just, you know, I'll never make the same record twice. I never sing a song the same twice, mm. you know. Um, so it really suits me. I, I think there's a, there's a little bit of a chameleon in me and I like to, and I authentically like you know, distortion, but I authentically love acoustic beauty. And I, I love the sound of a building coming down, but I also love the sound of, of, of the wind through the trees, you know? So I love to be able to, to do that musically. Um, you're always learning, you know, from, from different people. You know, I was asked to do a, produce an album for a band called Toe to Toe a mm. couple of years ago. Now those guys was kind of at one stage, you know, they were the hardcore punk leaders in this country. And, and I thought, God, I've never, I never really even bothered listening to that kind of music. Uh, however, I found it compelling to say, yes, mm. uh, how am I gonna actually make a record for these guys? Yep. You know, for, to start it, for starters, you know, the singer grew up in a, you know, a neighborhood where it was, if, if you were walking on his side of the street, it was okay to punch the shit out of you, mm. you know? Um, I didn't come from that, that neighborhood. Um, I came from a neighborhood where you punch the shit out of yourself. <laughs> um, but anyway, I didn't, I had no idea. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. And, you know, and f through my experiences, I remember normally I have a vision for a, a project. If I'm say being a producer, I kind of can tell you what I can't tell you, but I can hear what it's going to sound like before we even start. I can hear what it's going to become. And, um, with these guys, I, I parked my car and I was walking in the studio. I had no idea what I was going to do. And I kind of liked it. It was exciting. But then I remembered a story that Di Pritchard, who is now the guitar player from Rose Tattoo, was telling me about Peter Wells, mm. the original guitar player. And I guess the story in the spine is about commitment. Rock and roll and music is commitment commitment to your heart commitment to your cause or whatever it is and this this is this happened on a night where peter had cancer and and Di was the new guitar player peter was in the audience and after the show peter came backstage and and Di said you know how was it and, and pete said yeah it was good it was good can i have your guitar and, and Di gave pete you know he's flying v and it was open tuned and and pete's sort of retune the guitar and he's he's pushed the G string sharp and then you know when you hit that that slide and it's, yep. it's it's wincy you know it's like oh. Di's gone what's that about and he's gone and Pete's just simply gone 
Yeah, really pisses them off. <laughs> right? So, so, you know, what does that say? What does yeah. that say? It says to me, Dice still tunes that G string sharp. Now, you know, Rose Tattoo weren't about, hey, I love you, man. It's yeah. really good. It was about, it was angry and it was about, you know, f fighting for what you believed in. It was a, it was a boys' club, yep. you know, and um, and that was the commitment to it. I'm going to tune my guitar out of tune because it's going to really piss them off. And that saved me with toe to toe because I went in there and I thought, it just has to be angry. This sound, uh, I, I created bass sounds that were sounded more like bilge and down the bilge of a Russian, you know, fighter ship, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, so it was really great. Uh, so that's, um, you know, so I learnt that and I got to experience that with Toe to Toe. And now I've just come off making a, a Glenn Shorick record of all Greatest Little River Band hits yep. that sounds yeah. more like Soul Motown Swamp. Um, and I equally love that. Yeah. Is, is there a, a vulnerability that you feel when you walk into this? I mean, just the Toe to Toe example is probably a, yeah. a fantastic one. but. Yeah. A lot of people would shy away from that because you're outside of your comfort zone. You you lose that sense of control. You don't know what's going to happen, and usually it's a place where you you don't have the comfort of knowing what you know. Mm. So you're really learning on the flight. There's that extreme vulnerability. Is that I assume it's something you feed off a little bit. Yeah, I've learnt to trust the gift mm. of music and creativity always sees me through the more risk i'm willing to take the better it is always if i playing it safe is not my game i don't enjoy that lyrically has that always been a case as well so lyrically. pushing like because obviously musically yes different genres um especially if you haven't had a lot of exposure to a certain type of music and you've got a oh well i'm gonna try and pick this up and work out what i'm gonna do and run with it but um lyrically is another dynamic altogether it's another level um is that something that you would take that same approach with with the words that you put out there as well yeah you know look I, i'm not i'm not an overly educated man um And if, but if, if songwriting is about connecting, I'm not scared to tell you the truth. And I think people connect with the truth. You know, um, I'll tell you stories that are true and really true. And I find that, you know, I can have my audience, you know, in a, one of my solo shows where I, do, I tend to do a lot of blabbing. <laughs> um, it's it's blood and guts and it's i can see them just sometimes just like jaws to the ground going you did what and if you did why are you telling us this <laughs> <laughs> you need to keep this to yourself <laughs> yeah um yeah you know so i'm cool with that i like that that's real it's just what it is you know um, and i think you know i don't know there's some kind of um I don't know. I, I, I think it keeps me pure. Hmm. You know, I don't really need to carry around any baggage. I don't mean. I know. I try. I, try not, I don't dump on people. I think I, I've got a good uh, idea when people are interested and when they're not. You yeah. Know, so, <clears throat> and I think. I mean, that's probably the benefit of music as well. Is that going back to what you said earlier about you know the scenario of three people looking at a car accident and all seeing different things yeah. the interpretation of music can be very different mm. even if you're writing in a very literal sense mm. people mm. are only as good as their environment and their experiences and what they've learned along the way so you can you can spell something out but they'll still they still interpret it a different way and that's that's probably the soft and the the um the the cautious not cautious is not the right word but the the safe element of music where music's the tool that helps people to be able to express themselves in a way that's not as confrontational as two people having a conversation me saying well here's everything and just and someone else going oh geez how do i how do i handle this how do i manage this conversation but music's something where i i get to i get to extract everything out i get to put it in on a platform and then 
it's on the table and everyone can can come and go as they please. Mm. And I think that's such a fantastic thing. And, um, you know, I've gone through this myself and I know a lot of friends that have also had this challenge where you're writing and you get to the words and you just think everything I'm writing is just rubbish mm. because I'm being too vulnerable or people are going to interpret this the wrong way or people are going to, people are going to think this is just either sappy or too, too deep and meaningful. Um, and a lot of people just keep things written and keep them tucked away and never, never share them with anybody else. So it's, um, I think the, the, having, having the opportunity to put music out there and having people just come and go and interpret in different ways is so powerful. And I think that helps a lot of people that battle their own challenges to be able to communicate in, in a different way where most other people that don't get to produce music or, you know, create, um, may struggle. Hmm. Um, was there any, I don't know, any particular songs over the years where you've had to sort of go through that process where you sort of hesitated and thought, do I want to share this? Do I want to, do I want to put this into a song or has it been more of a, an urge behind it where this, it's just non-negotiable? It just has to, it has to go out. Well, I had the, I have had, there is one song in my life that I wish I didn't have my name to. Absolutely. Uh, and it was Hot Chili Woman because mm. it was a joke. It was a kind of a, it was just to buy me some time. And I was able to write something in 10, 15 minutes. And unfortunately, it's got my name to it. It's probably the worst Australian song in the whole, of, you know, the last two decades. So there may be, <laughs> there may be a couple of equal contenders, but, <laughs> you know, uh, it's a real bummer. I, I really, uh, you know, I got a chip on my shoulder about that one, um, but everything else I've written since then, uh, you know, I'm okay with. Um, you know, I'm glad that that you know everyone doesn't look at at writing and creating the same way because it'd be really boring if it was sort of you know I, I can be fairly serious and fairly deep in a lot of ways, and I could be a total idiot in in you know, in others, but, um, you know, we need people to, to write fluff and we need people to write, you know, happy music and, and, you know, this is all right. It's Saturday night or whatever, you know, all that, that, I think it's really important that we have that palette, you know, cause we do see things differently and people need different, you know, we all have different needs. Is it like, especially when you put yourself out there, when you're writing, you're writing about your story, mm. your experiences along the way. And when you're writing some of that more deep, vulnerable content, that, that, those lyrical themes, has there been times with some of those songs where you sort of think, oh, geez, like I'm really putting myself out here. No, no, I, I'm, I'm cool with it. Uh, there's a song, you know, called the idiot, uh, that I wrote, uh, it's about, you know, it was the end of my, uh, it was the beginning of the end of my uh, battle with, with addiction. Uh, and I had done something that I deeply regretted, you know. Um, I pretty much stole from a friend and uh, to, to get money to use. And, um, and the song clearly explains that. And, you know, it's, I guess, you know, it's an apology at, 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 at great heights, mm. you know, at, I just wanted to apologize so badly. And, um, and so I wrote the song and it's out there and it's, you know, you can listen to it and it, 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 it tells you the whole thing and it goes through everything. I mean, you know, I like that. I'm, I'm okay. Totally okay with that. I'm okay with, um, you know, the, the, the dark side of life that I've had to, that I've managed to survive through. Um, and I'm okay with telling the story of that. Um, I don't think necessarily, I'm, I don't think I'm telling the story so that others don't do that because I'm not, I'm not so foolish to think that, you know, my life matters that much to other people, but, um, but I did survive and, um, and that's just my story. So I'm happy to tell it. No doubt. Even though, as you said, like you, it's not 
to stop other people from making particular decisions. But no doubt, because you're putting it out there in that way, that people are getting something from it. And once again, going back to the car crash scenario, everybody's looking at it from a different point of view. Mm. So they they hear the words, they read they read the words and interpret it and put it into context of their own life. And no doubt, I'm just, you know, no doubt there'd be people over the years who have looked at that and other songs that you've written and it's probably been a massive help for them. Look, I, I must say I have had a lot of wonderful feedback over the years um, of, of, you know, my lyrics and music connecting with people um, in sometimes quite cathartic way. Uh, and that's, that's really nice. Um, I kind of like people crying at my gigs. <laughs> <laughs> Cry, <laughs> all of you. Uh, and, you know, it's it's a real honour. Mm. It's a real honour when yep. people, when you make people feel like that. You know, it's like wow, that's it's uh, pretty raw. It's totally raw. I mean, you know, you want to connect. Yeah, you're really connecting, man. You know, whether it's tears of joy or tears of um, acceptance or you know, sadness. Um, it's all, it's all good. That's my job. You know, that's yep. what I, that's my, that's my lot. That's what I do. Did, did that help you get through those moments, through those changes in your life when you've, you've gotten to a point of sobriety and, and maintaining that and just getting past a lot of those challenges, those darker moments was, I guess the music element, you know, a big device that's helped you sort of keep your head above water. I think the music's just been constant. Um, I, you know, I think there's the, the thing that's helped me maintain my sobriety is my commitment to, um, uh, the fellowship that I'm part of, uh, simply that mm. uh, the music is just a byproduct of how I am and how I feel yep. on a day to day basis. And, you know, when I look at, um, you know, my performance, even, um, you know, during the war, I call it, um, you know, my performances were very powerful. They were angry and they were sad and they were really, it was raw. Mm. I learnt how to scream, mm. you know. I learnt how to get up there and I learnt how to bellow. Um, and then, you know, when the sun came up, I was able to then go and perform from, uh, from the survivor's point of view, but I still knew how to bellow. Mm. You know, but I could, it could be from, from joy and victory rather than sort of the pain and sadness and longing. A bit more control as well. Yeah, I can turn it on and off. Mm. You know, I, I can literally turn it on and off. Um, creativity, I thought creativity would never be the same, you know. But what I found is that it was the same and I was writing the same thing all the time. It was just pain, 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 pain. You know, and now uh, I, I, and I thought it would be difficult to, because I'd never actually, you know, written a song clean. You know, I was always under the influence of something. And then I thought, wow, how am I ever going to write another song? I can now just turn it on, switch it on, switch it off. Just give me a little bit, you know? Well, I was going to ask that because I think there's... I, I don't think it's as bad these days because I think... I think mental health and I think people's health and well-being is praised a lot more than it's ever been in the past. I think yeah. there's a lot more musicians out there that wear wear their their health on their sleeve with mm. a with a sense of pride and um and i think that's fantastic but there's still still a lot of stigmas out there and, and i know a lot of guys even if it's just alcohol who believe that the only way they can get into a mindset creatively is to have a few drinks under the belt so mm. they can loosen up mm. lose their inhibitions and go through that process and i get it i understand but um, you know, what you just said is proof that there are other ways and there are other ways to get to those moments of creativity. And it might, it maybe involves a little bit of extra self-work and, and a bit more of a challenge and a bit more hard work to get to that point. But you can still find that, that flow, that creative flow and, and really immerse yourself and lose your inhibitions, but do it in a way that's not as damaging hundred percent and, and and 
I think um, might get to a much higher places. Mm. You know, um, it's amazing what uh, what what free falling is like. Mm. You know, I, I've never wanted to jump out of a plane. I don't have to. I'm I'm going to jump out of a plane tonight. You know, <laughs> when I when I play. You yeah. know, I'm just going to free fall. And what well, what's the worst that can happen? You know. You're either going to give them something that they've never had before, uh, or you're going to. I promise. I always promise an audience one thing, and I always promise. But I, I promise myself, and I've often said that if I'm going to go down, I'm not going to bounce. <laughs> I'm going to go straight through. <laughs> I love you know, it. I'm going to really. Uh, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, and look, I think one great thing about. Uh, yeah the industry these days and you touched on it earlier is that you know, the business of music I think that the competitions and the business of music is a lot is taken a lot more seriously so I don't think I don't think a lot of new artists have the time or you know uh, to, to be like that yep. you know it's not like sex drugs and rock and roll anymore it's like music making music and get it online Absolutely. and make my videos and create my content and mm. if I don't do that the next guy will yep. I better hurry up and I can't no I can't have a drink right now absolutely <laughs> yeah I think there's a bit more of that which is which is really great on one hand um, and um, you know but back in the day it was all about having a good time well especially if you had an industry where, well, the perception was there was more opportunity, but there was, you had labels, you had agents out there, people that were able to, I guess, pick up the slack mm. and you would only have to worry about a limited amount of things mm. and that's your focus. And once that's been addressed, then whatever, until the next, the next commitment comes along and you're right. I mean, now, you know, it's, it's fantastic. Everything's at our fingertips. Um, it's never been easier to record, to release, to um, connect with people all over the world, like share music within half a second. It's just shooting off to the other side of the planet. Um, and there's a lot of cons that go along with that. There's a lot of noise and other stuff that has to be cut through. But you're right. I mean, people can't afford to just sit back and just cruise along. It's, it's a fast paced thing. It's very DIY, which involves people having to problem solve, having to build up additional skills to try and stay ahead of the pack. And I love that because I think, you know, as a result, me personally, I've certainly become a better person just out of necessity <laughs> because of just the way that, that everything's changed. Um, but you see it around you and you see your peers doing it as well. And you see someone suddenly create something, you know, from a, from a visual point of view or, or something that's just completely different to what they're known for. And you just go, wow, that's, that's incredible. I didn't know that was in you. And they turn around and say, I didn't even know either. And so because of social media and all these things as well, we see each other, everyone's doing selfies and Instagram videos and everything. And we're documenting our lives. I think people are more inclined to show the I'm together mm. moments. You know, I'm getting things done. Mm. I'm I'm being fit, active, healthy in, in body and mind and because they want to be perceived in a certain way. And that's fantastic. It does have an, an additional uh, element of baggage that can cause problems as well. But um, you know, looking at it from a from an optimistic point of view, there's there's certainly been a lot of uh, a lot of great things that have happened due to all these changes. Absolutely. If you if you're prepared to uh, to keep learning, and and I've got to say, you know, that the industry changes nearly on a monthly basis. Mm. You know, uh, it's different to what it was six months ago. Yep. You know, uh, Spotify always changing the goalposts, and <laughs> and uh, you know, we need to really be on our toes. We need to be aware, and um, it's exciting. I, I think it's really exciting. Uh, there's for lots of reasons. I mean. You know, I think um, it's it's taken. You know, speaking from from my point of view, being a, a, a sort of an elder statesman now, um, you know, been around for a, for a long time, and I think my you know music is is better than it's ever been. I think my voice is better. I think I'm doing everything better. I'm I'm constantly learning. I promise you, I would never, I would never 
put myself out there if I was decrepit and crappy. Mm. You know, I think, but I think I still really honestly got something, authentically have something to offer. And, um, and the, the new age and the new way um, has, has delivered an opportunity for me to keep, to keep working. Yep. You know, uh, you know, I've just played three sold out shows um, and we've spent $30 on social media advertising. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? You know, it's incredible. And it's, uh, so it's wonderful. You know, back, you know, if I go back, you know, two decades, it's like, oh, we've had to spend a fair bit on, on advertising. However, back then was pretty good as well. I've got to say, I mean, if you had a, you know, if you had a, an act for lack of a better better word um you had good management and you got a record deal and you got airplay and you were prepared to back it up you know success was pretty easy to come by you know so i think it's a lot harder now well and you certainly you certainly hear that from people that have been around for a few decades and have seen the changes in the industry and i know a lot of people that I still sort of sitting in the past and saying, well, it's, it's not as good as what it used to be and, yeah, yeah. and probably more focusing on the, the negative aspects mm -hmm. of, of what's currently happening now. Most and... of my peers are <laughs> bloody whinges. <laughs> and I mean, but even in more recent times in the last, in the last decade as well, I mean, as you said, like every month is changing. The goalposts are changing all the time. You've mm. got to find where's the new medium, where's the new, uh, you know, where's the attention going? Mm. Yeah, you know, and that's just constantly changing day by day. And but in the last decade, I mean, I see the transition of physical, you know, format, vinyl, vinyls come back a little bit, um, CDs and and all that, and then going to digital downloads and now streaming. And so I have a lot of peers that look at it and go, this is crap. This is, it's all falling apart. What do you do? And then you just think, well, you can focus on what's wrong or you can just focus on what's right. And there's an element of control. And, I, and I'm like a broken record. I always say it. You need to focus on what you can control rather than what you can't control. You can't control the industry changing. So there's no point sticking in the past and wishing that it was like it used to be because it's not going back. If it goes back, then it won't be because of you. Mm. It'll be because of the mass, the collective. Mm. So you need to move with the collective and you can definitely stay true to yourself and do things your way, but you have to be open to what you can control and embracing the changes that happen along the way as well. Otherwise you just get left in the dust. Yeah. I've, I've, I see it and I hear it quite often. Um, I, I am. Um... I'm not sure why. I, I think, you know, it all comes back to, uh, to my recovery as well. You know, um, some of the principles in of recovery, you know, one of the principles in particular being open-mindedness. And, you know, uh, if that's one of the principles you live your life by, well, as a musician, I'm, I'm open-minded to this thing. Okay, well, the goalposts have changed. Well, how do we do this then? Well, I love the fact that I'm you know, still playing the game, you know, I, I enjoy it. Um, my music means too much to me to just sort of go, oh, you know, I'm going to be stubborn and I'm going to, you know, go and put up my poll posters and <laughs> hopefully someone's going to come and I go, okay, well, I spent $2,000, nobody came. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then blame everybody else. Yeah. yeah. And whose fault is that now? Yeah. <laughs> That's, it's, it is really exciting. Um, you know, I must say I'm, I'm blessed with an incredible manager, Jeremy Hutton, who is an incredible human being, not only uh, on, a, on a spiritual level, but, you know, his intellect and his understanding of the business and his work ethic is uh, really helps me do what I need to do, which is make music and, and collaborate and getting it out there on this new, these new platforms. And, um, you know, he's, he's wonderful. So I'm lucky there. And a lot of artists that don't have that sort of management, I, it's hard because I've been there, you know, I, I, I was there for the last sort of, you know, you know, five, six years without management. And it's really hard doing everything yourself. Well, operation, from an operation point of view, just physically having to do it all the time. But even for you just to be open-minded, going back to what you said and thinking ahead, being strategic of, where you go in the future 
you know, that's that's a hard thing to, to take on if you're doing everything else yourself. How can you have an open mind when you're so immersed in just trying to keep everything afloat? Yeah, look, credit to, you know, credit to the frontliners and, you know, all my, all my peers that are, that are doing what they doing what they do you know it's you know look uh, it's such a beautiful industry you know music and creativity seems to have seems to be made up of such beautiful hearts you know um you know i went to a funeral recently a, a wonderful musician you know um a guy called paul gray and mm. we were at the church up there in at king's cross and I looked around at four or five hundred people just thinking, wow, I, I know all of you and <laughs> I actually really love all of you. It's such great people, the stories and the, the feeling of being able to share music together and give it to an audience that we've all done collectively or, you know, it's just, uh, it's incredible the, the quality of person that, that music helps develop. Um, I think it's because it's such a, it comes from such a deep place that you need to be in touch with the things that matter. So um, they seem to be able to, uh, you know, cultivate a, you know, a great place on this planet. Well, coming from that deep place and touching back on, I guess, technology and the industry changing, one thing I only just recently discovered and was just had to pick my jaw, jaw up off the ground was this collaboration you did with, was it Jessica Irwin? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'll let, I'll let you explain it, but this software mm. that's helped create or in, uh, enable mm. this this music collaboration between two people um, that I guess, you know, not too long ago would have been impossible. It's nothing short of extraordinary and you know, you hear that term, this term loosely used, but you know, game changer. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. if you've got cerebral palsy or something alike, where all you have control of is your mind mm. and your eyes, well, guess what, people? You can now make music. It's incredible. It's that simple. Yeah. It's unbelievable, and and to be part, a small part of this. Uh, this technology and the development of it is a real honour. I, I, you know, I'm really blessed to be part of it. Well, I watched the video clip and I'll, I'll put it up online so people can can have a look at it. So my my understanding is only what I could see visually there, but from what I could see, it's it's recognising where the eyes are pointing on a screen, mm. and that's sending a message through. Obviously, an output to whatever whatever the, whatever that uh, decision is that musical decision that's being made yeah look at the moment like it's because it's right at the beginning uh, of its creation really um it's got and it, it the, the potential is extraordinary mm. and uh, a guy called dr jordan newen yep. who is an incredible human being and his team at psychonetic um through through jessica I'll just tell you a, a brief story. Jessica has been a fan of mine for many years and, she, you know, she'd always be in the, you know, the upfront wheelchair position. Uh, so we've, you know, we've caught eyes and, and we got to know each other over the years. Now, she somehow got in touch with Jordan you and they were together at one of my shows and, and Jordan being a very perceptive, sensitive man sort of saw in Jesse's eyes that, he said to her, he said, you want to be up there, don't you? And she said, you know, in her way, yes. And uh, so he set about trying to create a, a, a platform that she could create music. And what he came up with is a thing called Atmosphere. And what it does, at the moment, it's kind of like a sampler. So, you know, I could create some sounds give it to Jess and she can put, load it up into atmosphere. And it, basically it's like a pie shape chopped up in say 12 pieces with different banks. So you could have, you know, three banks of 12 mm. pieces. Um, and then through eye recognition, she can hit, you know, slice one and it would be a certain sound or a chord 
or a note and and therefore then create a sequence in you know making music that we could then play together which is incredible which is in in itself the next stage of of atmosphere is that jess is able to create her own sounds uh, like i would say using pro tools mm -hmm. so instead of me going what do you think jess do you like these sounds her being able to source that stuff herself and um and then come to me with here's a groove and here's some chords what do you think well so that's where it's going uh but you know so the the performance that we we just did to launch atmosphere um was a rework of a song that Jess wanted to do of mine. It was a song of mine that she wanted to... Lyrically, it made sense. So we recreated it. So we performed this song. Jess played the piano and I sang. <laughs> and I don't know if you ever sung with, a, with an accompanist, but they've got to have their shit together <laughs> because it can really fuck you up. Yeah. <laughs> and she was great. She, you know, she, she does this. Um, it's, it's possible. We play together. Um, it's pretty remarkable. Imagine, imagine having, being in just a situation, cerebral palsy, having wonderful mind, creative mind, um, control of your eyes, and and you, and imagine wanting to make music, not being able to play piano, not being able to play guitar, not being able to sing. Now she can sit in her world and create music it's another form of communication isn't it expression like expression just yeah getting but so much know, out that imagine having been... that trapped inside you having having rhythms and and melodies trapped inside you thinking i'm destined to never be able to share this or never to be able to express this it's it's hard to it's hard to even hard to wrap your head yeah it head is. around it, it it is man it's it really is so yeah look that's at the beginning um you know it's it's certainly a timely process and and this will all be sped up you know as the technology gets better mm. and and uh psychonetic actually you know develop this um technology but um yeah it's great great to be part of it is is it right in saying that you're both going to do a performance in melbourne yeah, we're doing a TEDx. Um, uh, Dr. Jordan's doing TEDx and Atmosphere is part of it. So we're, we're going to be doing a performance down there. Great platform to reach a lot of people. Sorry? It's a great platform to reach a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. It, that's, um, yeah. yeah, there's so much to that. And I guess, as you said, there's you know, this is only the beginning mm. um, and the potential is just incredible. Absolutely. Eye recognition for, for people um, with that disability uh, uh, is, is really amazing because music's just one part of it. You know, they can, be, they can be creating games, they can be playing games, they can be, you know, it's endless, really. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Has these types of moments along the way helped form what you're doing now as far as i know you mentioned earlier before we started recording just you've been working on uh, filming a video clip for an upcoming single new album's not out till next year um i guess where i'm going with it the influences around this upcoming album where have they drawn from have they drawn from things like this these experiences where you're just suddenly being put into areas like um, reoccurring theme that that vulnerable aspect where you're still putting yourself in a situation where you're being challenged. Yeah, well, I, 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 I basically uh, took the challenge. Um, as I said, I don't like making the same record twice. And I, I came across, I came across a blog. Um, it was more, more so the photograph in the blog. It's a blog called Humans of New York. Mm. And I saw this photograph of this this man in a wheelchair with grey hair. S seems like he had his life on in a in a plastic bag on the handle of the chair, looking straight down the barrel of the lens. Really piercing blue eyes, and the caption of the photograph was, 
I look like God, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, I just thought, oh man, this is a, this, uh, I just absolutely love this. So I started thinking, wow, what a great idea. What if this guy was God? If mm. there is a God, what if, what if it was him? And God was just playing the big sucker punch. We're all looking to the skies above, and there's this cat in the wheelchair just keeping an eye, you know. Being was, ignored by a majority of people going absolutely. by. Absolutely. You know, being is. trodden over a lot yeah. of the time. And, and I just thought, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to write a song about this guy. And a friend of mine, um, Jake Challoner, um, was in JB Hi-Fi, and he found the book of the photographs of humans of New York. And... And I said, well, I'm just going to pick 10 photographs and I'm going to write 10 songs and that's going to be my next record. So that's what I've done with this stuff. What a great idea. I, I, as in, you've got the framework there of an album. And once again, your interpretation of a photo or a visual yeah. is going to be different to every single other person that looks at that photo. Absolutely. So yeah. suddenly you create a story based mm -hmm. off what you're seeing there. And, mm. and I, I guess that your story would be based on not just what you're seeing visually, but what focal points on that picture are reminding you of things that you know, like That's experiences it. that you've had, yeah. where you've gone, where you've been, the, the good and the bad mm. in context with that picture has mm. created a story. It's been a real challenge because, you know, normally, um, you know, I would write from my particular experience and I kind of still am. Mm. However, it's making me think of things that I would not, maybe not have thought of. Yep. Like, you know, the idea of this guy being God. I loved the idea of that. Um, so it challenged me. So it was a kind of a very different writing process for me. Uh, but you do tend to write from what you know mm. uh, or what you don't understand. Yep. You know, so... Um, I've, you know, I've loved making this record, I really love making this record. And, and, you know, it's in, in a way as well, um, some of the songs have taken maybe a, a, a sonic value that I may not have created otherwise. Like there's, there's one of the photographs, it's, a, it's a girl with braids in her hair and the beads that make up the braids are kind of have words on them. And they're sort of uh, the Aristotelian values, okay. yep. right? So it's, you know, words like, you know, love, you know, freedom, cherishing. So because it was a young girl, and the reason why I chose this photograph is this young child chose to have these wonderful words in her hair. And I thought, well, it made me feel like, well, maybe the world's in safe hands, mm. you know? So I wrote this song, it's called Head Full of Dreams. And, you know, it was, I had to make the music kind of young. It, it kind mm. of had to suit the photograph. Yep. It's, and to be honest, it's sort of probably not even the sort of music I would listen to, but as a creative expression, I felt like it, it felt right. Mm. So, um, that was a real challenge because, you know, I play this track to people and people love the song. They're kind of a little perplexed that it's actually me, you know, <laughs> and I like that. I like the weirdness of that. And I like just how kind of wrong and right it is at the same time. It's exciting. Jeez. I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to, to yeah. hearing it, especially, I think that's probably, I mean, I don't know how you will present it and put it out there and what, it, I mean, obviously musically, there's that aspect, but then obviously visually, mm. um, how that's all represented, but to get just a hint of the context behind it, the hint of the thought process behind it. Um, it's amazing how much value you can find in music mm. and in someone's message when sometimes you get that little bit of extra, that 1% extra mm. in the background, you go, huh, okay. Now, now I know where that person's coming from. And and not that it's wrong, not knowing the background. Yeah. Because once again, reoccurring theme, it's up to interpretation. That's why music's so, so amazing. That's mm. why it is what it is. But um, sometimes that, that backstory, that, that, that progression of getting to that point where you've created something and even just to, 
to have that as an example of something that you would not normally ever listen to. Yeah, it's a real privilege, <laughs> isn't it? It's incredible. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. That's what, that's what I love doing. I love doing solo, intimate shows. You know, it's just me and a guitar because I, I can I give you the backstory, and and it's incredible the you can you can feel it the song going deeper. Uh, you know, you can see that an audience sort of going, oh, really? Wow. And then you sing the song and they, they, they get it from your perspective, mm. uh, which is something that is interesting, you know, listening to a song. I, he wrote it because of this. And I love, I love that myself. So it's nice to be able to, to give that to an audience. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a good thing. I mean, Unfortunately, you can't sort of go around the world doing, you know, explaining your songs to people. So hopefully, you know, lyrically, you've done a decent enough job to evoke something that will connect with people. But um, yeah, there you go. Well, we've only just scraped the surface, but I think that's a good place to to end it for now. We'll have to we'll have to catch up sometime down the track because any time man. you're you're one of. <clears throat> Well, there's probably quite a few people, but in my opinion, there's one of few, at least here in Australia, that have been involved in so much. And going back to what I said earlier about my perception of you, and especially over more recent years, is very project-based. Finding things and being a part of it and being in, I mean, such a wide variety of different things. Like, mm -hmm. And when I was going back and compiling notes to, to sit down and have this conversation with you, I'm looking at going, really? Like... I can't believe that you got involved with that or that. So there's so much there and, um, and I'll definitely have to, to dig into that at a later date. But, um, I think for now there's a lot going on and you've got the new album coming out next year. There's a couple of singles coming. So I'll put all the relevant info online. So people that are listening to us now and are curious and like the sound of where it's all going and, mm -hmm. and people that are discovering you for the first time as well, which mm -hmm. still continues to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, have got an opportunity to check it out more, but um, really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to seeing where the, the next album goes and then everything else, ev whatever the next random project that you're involved with. Thanks for the privilege of being able to talk to you, man. Thank you. Great. Thanks everyone. If you want to reach out to Steve and check out any of the things that he's involved with. And as we discussed, He's got his fingers in a million different things. He's a busy guy. So you can go over to stevebalby.com. Um, links to everything else that he's been associated with over the years will be in the show notes over at andysocial.net. Um, he's got the new album, Humans, that's coming out early next year. He's got a couple of singles coming out. He's got some upcoming dates as well. So stevebalby.com will be the best place to go. Um, if you want to learn about any of the things that we spoke about in this episode, especially the collaboration with uh, Jessica Irwin and the atmosphere technology, um, you can go over to andysocial.net and check out those links. But a massive thanks to Steve for your time and also to Jeremy, his manager, who um, made it all happen. And as I said at the beginning of this chat, Jeremy, you've got to get on this podcast sometime. You've, you've got some really cool stories to tell. So I hope that we can make that happen sometime down the track. But thank you again. And thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Now, before we wrap it up, as always, if you want to support this podcast, you can do so in a whole range of different ways. Uh, you know, a bit of social media love, sharing things around, recommending this podcast to other people means a hell of a lot. Word of mouth is so underrated. It's so underrated in a way that it's spoken about all the time where people go, oh, word of mouth is great, you know, but it, it really is. And that's how this podcast has been building. It's the word of mouth that makes the difference. So thank you so much to people that tag mates in posts, um, share it to family members, to friends. Um, and I know that this has had a really, really positive impact on quite a few people that listen to this podcast and just get to listen to different people's stories and um, get reassurance of different people's struggles and different people's journeys and understand that we're not all that unique when it comes down to it. On the surface, it looks like we're all doing very different things, drastically different things, drastic, drastically different lives, but under the surface, we're all the same. We're all, we've all got the same things that we deal with and um, it's so cool to see people getting reassurance and getting value on that type of level as well. So thank you so much for, for supporting in that way. Um, you can support in a whole range of different uh, ways. Merchandise, you can shout me a beer via the PayPal button over at andysocial.net. Um, go and support lord, lord.net.au as well. Um, and you can also, I don't know, a self-starter as well. Whatever it might be. You know the drill, guys. I always blab on. So enough of me. Thank you so much. Another podcast in the bag. We've got another one next week. Take care. And until next week, ta-ta.